One of the things I love about God, maybe you don't love this about God, but it's one of the things I love about God, is that he knows exactly what we need of before we know we need it. But he doesn't always come through the way we expect him to come through. God doesn't always do things the way we expect things to be done. There was the prophecy that Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, would come to the earth as the Messiah. So man expected that he would come as a king in a palace. But he came as a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger. He doesn't always do things the way we expect or want them to be done. Such is the case in the story in the Bible of the lame man at the gate called Beautiful. I want to read this passage to you today. And I want to speak to you today about prosperity. I want to speak to you today about financial blessing. About expecting something from God, needing God to come through in an area of your life, but he come through in a way that you did not expect. All right, let's look at this in Acts chapter 3 today. Acts is in the New Testament. It's after the Gospels. It's the Acts of the Apostles. It's it's when the Holy Spirit is released on the earth. It's the birth of the church that we know today happens in the book of Acts. And there's these two disciples, these two apostles named Peter and John. It says this, and Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. All right? Now, if you're reading this in the King James Bible, it will say that they went to the temple in the ninth hour around the ninth hour. Um, there were three prayer slots in this time. There was the 9 a.m., the 12 noon, and the 3 p.m. Abraham instituted the 9 a.m. Isaac added the second one at noon, and then Jacob comes along. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, three, three generations. Jacob added the 3 p.m. But when it says the ninth hour in your Bible, it's referring to 3 p.m., the later time slot. So Peter and John probably slept in, and they're going to the 3 o'clock service. And they, Peter and John, verse 2, it says, approached the temple, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. So Peter and John are walking toward a normal day of prayer, and this gentleman is being carried in, toward a normal day of begging. Huh? Both going about what they normally do. Both being moved toward a common location for a divine connection that will forever change all of their lives. They were going about what they normally do, but they're both moving towards a divine location for a connection that God foreknew was going to happen He set this situation up so that these guys would come in contact at this time. And we're still talking about this story today. Okay? So we are, God put this together so that we could grow and that we could learn and that we could know what's happening. The Bible says this, each day, every single day, this man was put beside the temple gate. Each day, someone carried him to the temple gate. And I, I wonder who those people were. Who carried, the Bible doesn't say. Who carried him there every day? How did he get there? Did he have a rotation schedule of friends that would pick him up? Was it, would he just hitchhike? How did, how did he get there? Was it family members who carried them there? We don't know. But this was a huge commitment from somebody somebody probably probably somebody going to the temple for the 9 a.m. prayer service probably would take him but we don't know they would take him each day to the gate called beautiful so he could beg from people going in and out of the temple so fun fact those temple gates if you ever read the Bible where it says the gate called beautiful those gates were 31 feet tall, so taller than this ceiling. The outside of this building is 35 feet tall, so that tall, and 62 feet wide. This room is 100 feet wide. 
So, I mean, these gates were huge, huge, huge gates. Now, I know that no one likes to beg. No one likes to beg. E even if you do see somebody around town generally asking for money, normally they're kind of like looking around, shake the can so the coins make some noise. It can be awkward asking people for money. When we talked about how are we going to do offering in this room now that we have to social distance because we cannot pass a bucket down the aisle. We're like, well, wonder if someone walks down the aisle with the bucket and people drop it. And I said, not, not me. I ain't doing that. That's awkward. Having to look at somebody in the face. And you're like, no, no, that's okay. No, okay. <laughs> then they were like, well, maybe we can put buckets on a long stick. And then you pull, you know, hold the stick. How long is the stick? <laughs> These rows are over 10 feet long. And then if you pull the stick back, you're going to hit someone in the other aisle. Right? It's awkward. Nobody wants to do that. Do you know how hard it is to get a staff pastor to come up and do the offering? Because no one actually wants to do that. No one wants to talk about finances or money. No one wants to ask somebody for money. Think about when you need money. Did you really want to call your mom and dad and ask them for money? I love my dad. He might even be watching right now. But if I ever had to ask, borrow money from my dad, it was like one of the worst things ever. Like he enjoyed it. It was great. But then, let's just say I went and bought lunch a couple days after I borrowed money. My dad would say something like this, must be nice to have money for lunch. <laughs> what do you mean I have to eat? Must be nice, you can go spend money on lunch without you paying me back yet. <laughs> Crying eating that sandwich I just bought for $5. But I actually think this guy was pretty resourceful. He was able to rally people around him to get to this gate every day. He was very committed to this. He has never walked, the Bible says, that he was lame from birth. So from birth, his legs did not function. Yet, he was industrious enough to get people to carry him each day. He was committed to this each day. Say each day. Every day. It didn't matter whether it was raining out. He was going to be sitting out there asking for money. They carried him. He got people to get him to where he needed. But notice this. It says that they could only carry him to the gate of the temple. They could not carry him in. He, he, he could not go inside. It, it would have been a shame. It would have been awkward for him to be inside in, in that society, in that setup. And, and it's kind of funny that church at large kind of does the same thing to people, makes, makes certain people feel like they're not welcome to go to church. Well, I could never go to church. If people knew my kind of life, oh my God, they knew I, I, I could never go to church. If I went to church, the roof would cave in. As if God would mess up my building because of your behind. So this is a true account, this is a true story, but there is also symbolism to us. We are that lame person, you're all lame, so lame, outside of the kingdom of God before salvation. We're outside of the kingdom of God before salvation without the ability to save ourselves without the ability to carry ourselves into the kingdom. We cannot, in our own strength, in our own efforts, in our own deeds, in our own uh, works, carry ourselves into the kingdom of God. We had to be carried in by faith given to us from God. So check this out, verse 3. When this guy saw Peter and John coming, he is like, all right, payday, right? He saw Peter and John about to enter, and he asks them for some money. In fact, what he would say would be something like this, alms, alms for a poor old beggar, alms, 
alms for a poor old beggar. And I, I think that it's interesting the location this guy chooses to be set each day. Location is very key if you're going to beg. It, it's key. You want to be somewhere around where people have just spent money or are going to spend money. Come on, let's think about this. Anytime someone solicited you, it's probably outside of a store or outside of the ramp to a store or outside of, at a stoplight by a store. You've just spent money. You might have change in your pocket because you spent $5 and they gave you back $1.50 for change. And, and, and who won't give a dollar away? Who won't give spare change away? Put it at a stoplight where now the cars are stopped, there's opportunity. So this guy strategically planned where he needed to go. Why the temple, though? It's pretty genius, actually. Because people went to the temple with cash, with gold and silver. They went to the temple to pay their tithe, and part of their giving was to give to the poor in the offering plate. So this guy said, I'm going to cut the middleman out. If someone's going to go into church to give money to poor people, they might as well just give it to me because I'm poor. Genius. Genius. Right? And he just thought that Peter and John were just two normal church-going guys. Say this with me. They ain't normal. Right. And I hope you think that about yourself. I hope you think that about yourself. I literally thought for my entire life, I'm 41 years old, I really did think that I was the most normal person in the entire world. And I would look at everybody else and say, what is wrong with them? What is wrong with people? As if I was the epitome of normality. And then I realized, I'm not normal. I'm the weird one, right? And I look at Peter and John. This guy assumes they're just two normal guys, but they ain't normal. And guess what? You ain't normal. You ain't normal. You may look like somebody else. You may look like your parents. You may look like a cousin, but you are an individual. You are an individual. You are not normal in standards of being compared to anybody else. You have a divine calling. You have a specific purpose. There is a specific plan tattooed on the DNA of your soul. This guy was looking for a quick payout. He was looking for a quick handout. He was looking for some quick change so he could eat that day. And verse 4 is where the story starts getting good. Verse 4. Peter and John look at him intently. And I don't know what was going through their mind. Were they feeling their pockets to see if they had any money? Are they looking at him intently because they're saying, okay, does this, have, does this guy have faith for a miracle? Are they looking at him intently because they're trying to figure something out? Are they going to discuss this? And Peter says to him, hey, Look at us. Look at us. Why? Because he was probably like this, right? Alms. Alms for a poor old beggar. He says, hey, you're going to ask me for money? You're going to ask something of me? Look at me. Look at me. You're going to ask something of me? Look at me. And I love this. He says, look at us. Because faith has to have vision. Faith has to have vision. You can't keep looking at your problem thinking that faith is going to somehow rise in your heart. You can't keep looking down at your circumstances. You can't keep watching bad news thinking that faith is going to somehow magically rise in your heart. Faith has to have vision. Faith has to see clearly. They're telling him, you're looking at the wrong thing, Papa. Look Change your vision. Change your thinking. Look at your situation differently. 
So then verse 5, it says, the lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. Ooh, he want me to look up. They're going to give me the big dollars. All right, let's just talk about that for a second, all right? You know... <laughs> You know when you go somewhere and there's valet parking and you didn't expect valet parking? You ever had that happen to you? And so you're like, oh my gosh, I only ever use my car. And you got like two $1 bills in your pocket. Huh? So the valet pulls your car up and so you got that $2 bill folded like 10 times so it feels like a wad of cash. <laughs> So, so they hand you your car keys and you give them the quick pound, you jump in the car and you take off. But, but there's something different about when you're going to tip the guy with like a $10 bill. You want him to see that. You have it all the way out. And you hand it eye level. I'm giving you a $20 bill. Cash money. <laughs> Look at me. See it. <laughs> so, so this guy, when he says, "Look at me," he's like, he's gonna be standing there like a hundred. Ah, look at me. Look at me. Look up here. So the guy's like, "Ooh." Normally, when they make me look up, it's for the big bills. So he's looking up like, "Yeah." Got his cup ready. And then, but then Peter drops him. I ain't got no money. <laughs> Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold. In the King James, he says, silver and gold have I none. But, but, I got to say King James, and then we'll go back and read NIV. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. I'll give it to you. I give it to you freely, such as I have, I give of thee. I give to thee. So Peter said, I don't have any gold or silver, but I'll give you what I got. But I'll give you what I got. My pockets might be empty, but my spirit is full. I want to ask you today, what's in your wallet? And this is not a Capital One card. And I'm not talking about money. What's in your spirit wallet? What's in your spirit wallet? What's in the storehouse? What do you have in the storehouse? What do you have in your spirit, man, when situations come, when someone needs a withdrawal from the kingdom of God? What is in your storehouse that you can say, I may not have exactly what you're looking for, but I have what you need. Think about the confidence for a moment. I don't have money, but I do have the ability to heal you. I wonder if we walk in that, in that confidence today. I don't really have what, you, what you're asking of me, but these hands, these hands are lethal weapons. These hands are registered in the kingdom of God. If I lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Anything I set my hands to will prosper and be successful. Do we operate in these confidence? I'm amazed at the confidence of these guys. They're like, hey man, we walk with Jesus. Not only did we see Jesus do miracles, but Jesus did this thing where he touched my forehead, I got the anointing, I've been laying hands on people all day long. I've been, I've been doing this sort of thing for three years now. Come on. I don't have silver and gold. Why don't they have any money? See, because that's the first problem. My daddy always told me, always carry cash in your pocket. Always have a couple dollar bills in your pocket. Because in Acts 2 verse 45, which is just five or six verses before this story, it says that... All of the believers in that region gathered together. 
they sold possessions and then they divided amongst each other as they needed. They didn't have silver and gold because they gave all their silver and gold away. They had what they needed for the day, they had what they needed for the week, the month, the year, but they didn't have the cash on them because they had already given that away. All the money was gone. But Peter and John were absolutely confident that they possessed something greater. They may not be rich in earthly riches at that moment, but they had eternal riches. They had eternal riches and they had the power of God. Sir, we don't have what you're seeking, but we have what God wants to bless you with. I don't have what you're seeking, but I have what you need. Then they pray, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In the name. They didn't say, in John's name. They didn't say, in Peter's name. They didn't say, in the power that I possess. They said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They didn't say, Jesus, could you please heal him? I've done, I've done a bunch of weddings the last few weeks. I don't generally do a lot of weddings, but it's been one of those seasons. And at the end of the wedding, um, after they kiss each other, which is always awkward for me because I'm right here. <laughs> so I normally just like look down at my paper as that's happening. I will say to the congregation, by the power given unto me, oh no, under the authority of God Almighty and the power invested unto me by the state of New York. And that's kind of what they're saying here. By the power invested unto us in the name of Jesus. I'm about to operate in the authority only invested to me through the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. But he didn't. He didn't. He, he, didn't, he didn't just get up and immediately walk. Because if, if you were already in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and you had been walking your whole life, and then you were injured and lost the ability to walk but then were healed, your mind knew how to walk. Your mind had a, had a uh, motor skill connection to your body. Oh, that's what that feels like. Oh, one, then two, left, then right. You would remember, I mean, yeah, you would have to do a little physical therapy, but you'd get it. This man has no memory of ever, he's never, ever, ever walked. He's never felt pressure on the soles of his feet to stand. Peter says, get up and walk. This guy's like, what's walk? What's the mechanics of that? I've seen people my whole life walk, but I've never experienced the sensation. This is the only perspective that I know. I've always viewed the world from ground level. I want to ask you today, have you accepted a life of viewing the world at ground level? Do you always see the cup half empty? Are you always overwhelmed by everything in life? Yeah, I got to go to work again today. Same stupid job. Guess what? You're laying on the ground. You're laying on the ground viewing the world from a ground level perspective. So Peter has to do something more. Peter's words alone were not enough to cause action in this man. Verse 7 says this, then Peter took the man. Yo man, you're going to interrupt my prayer time. You're at least going to do what I said. He takes the man by the right hand and that's kind of important too because the right hand is the hand that you shake. It's the hand of authority. Jesus is seated at the right hand. He grabs him by the right hand. He shows him some dignity. He shows him the respect and honor. He could have grabbed him by the ears and picked him up. He could have grabbed him by the hair. But he said, I'm going to extend dignity to this man. He shakes him with the right hand and he 
picks him up. He pulls him up. This man was seeking a handout. But God wanted to give my hand up. They could have fed him for today. Or they, but they chose to feed him for eternity. So I could feed you today, or I can empower you to feed yourself. Yeah. Welcome to Family Church. We don't like people who come to church to get fed. If, if, if you come to this church to get fed, you're starving all week. We love to teach people how to feed themselves. Only babies cry when they're hungry. Adults get up and make a sandwich. Adults know how to feed themselves. And at some level, spiritually speaking, we have to know how to feed ourselves. I've had people tell me, I'm leaving your church because I need to go somewhere that I'm getting fed. And you're probably still messing your diapers too. Like, what, what do you want me to say about that? You have a Bible. Read it. You have access to all sorts of things online. Read them. It is not the pastor's job to spoon feed you the word of God. If you're spiritually living off of one 30-minute sermon for the rest of the week, you're a starved believer. They said, we're not going to just feed you for today. We're not going to give you a handout. We're going to give you a hand up so you can go feed yourself. Watch this. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped, stood on his feet, and he began to walk. Then walking, then leaping and praising God. Where did he go? He went to church. He danced his way into the temple, the place he could never go in his previous condition. This miracle was more than a healing. It was a complete recreation of who this man was. His, his mind had to be changed to now know what motor skills were. Come on. He had to have a mental change. His thinking had to be changed. And I just want to tell you today, if you want to live and operate in a land of prosperity, your thinking has to change. Your thinking has to change. I'm going to go off notes. Is that all right? In the Bible, this is a quick, this is a quick lesson. Study this out. In the, in the Bible, when you give to the poor, when you give down the Bible only guarantees that that will come back to you. That what you give will come back. That's all it's guaranteed when you give to the poor. And a lot of people like to give to the poor because it makes them feel better about themselves. Right? I can give $5 and my $5 means so much more to the person who's asking for food. But, the, but in the Bible, when you give up, he says, then, then it comes back to you, 30, 60, 100-fold return, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. When you put seed in good ground, a harvest comes. Now, listen, there are not a whole lot of people who want to talk about that. They don't want to talk about that because that's like hyper-faith. That's like hyper-faith stuff. Pastor Mike, are you, are you trying to take offering after all this? No, that's not, that's not my point. I'm trying to change our thinking. I'm trying to help us in this season. In this season that we're all in. Come on, let's think about it for a second. Would you rather put seed in soil that is not going to grow or put seed in soil that is guaranteed to grow? A lot of times when you give to the poor, you're feeding them for that meal and you're going to have to feed them again and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. But when you give into things that are better, above, maybe even at a higher income rate, 
That's where the blessings of God are maturing because it's good soil. The Bible talks about that. Putting seed in good soil. They were not just going to give money to bad soil. He said, we got to fix the condition of this soil. we got to fix the condition of this soil. For some of us in here today, maybe finances has been one of those things that has been a struggle. I want to tell you what this man's problem was. This man's problem wasn't his legs. This man's problem was his vision. This man's problem wasn't his legs. His problem was his vision. He had limited vision. Although he was industrious enough to get himself into position to receive a blessing, he only had vision enough for one day. That's why he had to keep coming back every day because he had just enough vision for the day. He had just enough vision to keep his head above water. He was believing for baby blessings. His legs were not his biggest problem. Limited vision was his biggest problem. Although he was not blind, he could not see beyond his situation. Even in asking for the blessing, He was looking at his problem. He was staring at his problem. You're you're never going to magically see numbers appear in your checkbook by looking at the problem. I've seen this as the biggest problem during this pandemic season. Limited vision. People saying, Well, the way it's always been is no longer. What do I do? Look up. Look up. Look at us. I know you're looking down. I know you're looking at your problem. I said, look up. Change your vision. Change your perspective. Look up. Look at something other than the problem. And that's how God operates. That's how God operates. Peter and John could have gone and gotten this guy a meal. They could have got him a little Kennedy fried chicken from the corner. But that wouldn't have changed his circumstances. It would only change his belly. Instead, they healed his body so he could go get a job. They healed his body so he could go be employed. They healed his body so he could go put it to work to provide for his family. You see, God knows what you need before you know you need it. But he don't always do it the way you want him to do it. No, 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 no. Don't make me go get a job. Don't make me go work. Just give me money. Just feed me. I want to share a verse with you that maybe you've never heard in church before. Deuteronomy 8.18. Write this down. Write this down. If you're a business owner, write this down. If you're an entrepreneur, write this down. It says this. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms His covenant, which He swore to your ancestors, as it is today. It is God who has given you the ability to create wealth, the King James says. Create wealth. He put the ability within you to create wealth. Your job's not your problem, you are. Your limited vision is the problem behind your finances. You want to buy more things than you have money. Don't get yourself in debt. Don't get yourself on layaway plans. Be disciplined. Be disciplined. Put that little jar in your drawer and throw your spare change in it. That's your vacation money. I tell, I tell, the, I tell the staff pastors, when you do a wedding or a funeral or a special event and and someone gives you money for doing that, you get paid extra above and beyond, don't spend that money. Don't spend that money. That's extra money. Put that into your retirement. Put that away. Lock it up. Don't, Don't spend that stuff that you didn't need. Birthday money, anniversary money, Christmas money. Don't spend that. Don't spend that money. You didn't need it. You weren't needing of it. You weren't expecting it. Put that into your retirement. So that when you're older, you can live a better life. Okay. All right. I'm trying to help somebody today. (laughs) 
If you're struggling financially, the answer's already within you. The answer is within you. God has given you the ability to create wealth, but your vision has to change. Your vision has to change. This man was lying on the ground, and when Peter and John said, look at us, which direction did he have to look? I look unto the hills for where my help comes. My help comes from the Lord, the creator of the heaven and the earth. Look up. Look up. Your answer is up. You may have to change sometimes who you hang out with. Maybe you're hanging out with small-minded people who don't encourage you to think differently. This, this guy's entire life, he was surrounded by people who told him, this is as good as it gets. This is the best position possible for you to be in. Don't expect anything more. Here, we'll even help you get to the gate. But that's enough for you. Find people who dream bigger than you dream. Find people who think bigger than you think. Find people who save more money than you save. Find people who are going to encourage you to think about life differently. Hang around with some people that encourage you to look up. Hang around with some other believers who got it together. Now let me, let me just throw this out. Not all believers are good company. There's some bugged out Christians. There's some Christians I don't ever want to hang out with. Come on, I'm just being for real. I'd rather hang out with some sinners than some Christians. I'm talking about hang out with some Christians that enhance your life not suck the life out of you. All right? Hey. He says, listen, man, stop looking for the hand out. Start looking for the hand up. And once you get the hand up, thank God. Thank God. The first thing this guy did was he began to worship God. He began to dance his way into the temple. He jumped and leaped and he danced and he went to church. So, if you're watching online, this is not a get your butt back to church sermon, but if that's what you heard, so be it. <laughs> so be it. My point behind this sermon today is God knows what you need of before you know you need it, but he don't always operate in the way that you want him to. I'm just going to close out with this personal story of mine. I know that God is my source. And so if I've ever found myself in a time where I was like, Lord, I could really use a couple extra bucks to do something. I always go to God. I always put that request out. Lord, it would be nice to have a few extra bucks to do this for my kids or whatever else, right? <laughs> Once you know it, within a day or two, someone's like, hey, Pastor Mike, do you know anybody who builds decks? Hey, Pastor Mike, do you know anybody who fixes cars? Hey, Pastor Mike, do you know anybody who could put an outlet in my kitchen? I'm like, no, 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 God, God, God. I just wanted a check to show up in my mailbox. He said, no, I gave you a job. I provided you with a job. I gave you the ability to create wealth. Go get it. The Bible says this. The Bible says this. It says that God has provided all the food for the birds of the air. My office has a window I could look outside. I see the birds of the air walking around out in the grass, kicking over a twig, moving a leaf, pecking in the ground. The food is provided, but they gotta go get it. They gotta go get it. It just didn't fall into their nest. They didn't wake up and, oh, look at all these worms. They had to go get it. They had to go get it. Today, on this Labor Day weekend, I'd like to pray. Not so much for your finances, but for your vision. There's some people during this pandemic where you've allowed your dreams to die. You've allowed your dreams of what retirement might look like to die. You've allowed the dreams of owning a house to die. You've allowed the dreams of having a better car die because 
everything is different. Everything is changed. You've allowed your dream of the big wedding to die because how are we going to do a big wedding in this kind of season? Okay, whatever, whatever it is. I want to pray for corrective lenses. I want to pray for corrected vision in our lives. Father, we come to the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for the ability to think bigger than what we've allowed ourselves to think. That we begin to dream bigger dreams, more detailed dreams of the life that you've already placed in us. Our life is not this thing outside us that dictates how we are to get by day by day, but you put life within us. The Bible says the life that we now live, we live by faith. So Lord, I pray that the life, that the plans and the purpose that you've put in each of us, we begin to live out loud even now in this season. Lord, we pray that you would operate in ways that we never expected that you would show yourself known and real in ways that we could have never dreamed. Your word says, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has planned for those who love him. Lord, I thank you that you would not only touch our hearts and our lives, but you would touch our finances as well. I pray for increased finances into every home right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that whatever we set our hands to would prosper and be successful. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for those who walked in here today and their bodies are a little under the weather, that maybe sickness has tried to touch their bodies, that we speak to that sickness and disease and we command it to go right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray over our college students who have just gone out to college and, and, and we hear reports about colleges shutting down and, and huge uh, amounts of cases of the coronavirus happening in colleges. Lord, we pray protection over our children right now in the name of Jesus. Safety in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you today that as we close out this message and we enjoy our Labor Day weekend that you would give us wisdom as to how we conduct ourselves this weekend, and safety and protection. As we leave here today, Lord, we thank you that everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful. We are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you. Have a great weekend.